God you are. The last month has just proved so many things to so many people. And you know what? You still have more to prove. But Lord, thank you for bringing us out here today. Thank you for bringing us here safely. Thank you for bringing Pastor today, Lord. Thank you for bringing all of the people that are sitting here today, Lord. Lord, we're here because we know you're our champion. And we thank you for this service, and we hand it over to you in your name. Amen.
Lord, let the words that come out of all of our mouths today just be from you. Because you're the one who knows how to reach and touch the people's hearts, Lord. We just love you in your name. All right, so I just got back from Kenya. Um, so I'm going to give a, a brief testimony. Slash, I have a video that um, one of the pastors I, I work under while I'm there. He sent us a little video last night just to kind of share. And kind of what my thought on this is, is as I was going through Africa, we have the collage. Awesome. Throw that up real quick. Um, I go through Africa, and it's a real blessing to, to work. I mean, I'm actually working. Uh, I work for the Army, if y'all didn't know, if you know, cool. Um, I get an opportunity to go to Kenya twice a year and a month at a time. And over those years, I've built relationships with local churches, and that way I have a place to worship on the weekends and a place to worship during the week. And so, kind of a collage here. This is actually Pastor Jackson. You'll see him in a minute. But this is kind of how we roll through Kenya. Kenya is a predominantly Christian country. So it's kind of a blessing that all of my guys that I work with are Christians and believers. So it's kind of like one big Bible study as we work the whole way through. We drive to work, we're singing hymns, we're, we're worshiping God, we're talking about the Word of God. And it's just a blessing to be there. Um, I just want to give Pastor Jackson a, a brief moment to greet you guys. We get lost. everyday ministry. The word of God shows that the early church didn't just meet on a Sunday morning or a Saturday morning, but the Bible says they met from house to house and they, they also met at the temple. And this was a big burden in my heart to see the church and the ministry being done every day. And as a result of that, I started talking to the three members of our church then how we can commit ourselves to everyday ministry, everyday ministry, reaching out, praying at night, doing um, our other civil duties at daytime, reaching other people in the evening, coming and praying the whole night. And consistently and continuously, we saw the Lord growing and increasing us as a church. And not only that, but we saw ourselves beginning to penetrate into our community. And I'm so grateful for what the Lord has used us to do in this place. We know by His grace we have achieved the, the things that we have done here. It's very hard to do ministry, particularly in Africa. And uh, not just in Africa, but in a busy society where there is poverty, where there is sickness, where there is no enough. But the Lord put a burden into my heart, encourage the people available, encourage the people to be available. And as people continue serving the Lord, we saw people coming the whole night praying, the whole day available. For example, on Sunday morning we have like three services. We have a service that starts 6 a.m. to 7.30. That is particularly for people who, who may not be found during the normal Sunday hours because of the nature of their works and their families to support. And so the Lord put into my heart, go ahead and start a service that was for one and a half hours for those people. Then our second service started at nine afternoon. And uh, this is kind of like our main service. Then we have an evening uh, service that starts from three to six p.m. And as people continually consistently come and serve the Lord, they give themselves. Like every day we have a service. Every day we have a service. Doesn't mean everybody comes to church every day, but there are those people, if a person doesn't come on Monday, he come on Tuesday. If he doesn't come on Tuesday, he come on Thursday. And we have prayers going on, on and on. And I'm so grateful um, for the blessing of God that God has blessed us. We got a team of people going out every day to give witness and testimony and uh, share with the people the message of Christ, the love of Christ, my wife being one of them, 
and uh, other church members going every day house to house. And it's a blessing to serve the Lord. And as we commit ourselves, we have seen God blessing us, God increasing us, God expanding us, and causing His face to shine upon us. Thank you, God bless you. Amen. Amen. So I, 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 he's over the years. I, I, I've known Pastor Jackson for three years now, and uh, wow, what what a man who loves the Lord. What a man who brings availability to his church. You know, he had an opportunity to build a church in the richer side of town, and he chose to build it in the slums. You know, so his congregation is a group of people who work probably six to seven days a week. So the church being open and being available plays an intricate role in them being able to come worship and hear the word of God. Um, in the week that I'm there, I'm there for 10 days, he, he brings me in and we sit down on the Thursday that I fly in and he gives me this laundry list of what you're going to do while you're here. So he's really been one of those pastors that builds me up. Like, Pastor Shibs gives me the grace. I get over there, he gives me the fire. African yeah. preaching is a lot different than American preaching sometimes. Those guys get worked up. Now, he's a finished work, grace, right? right. Pastor, it's, which is hard to find yeah. in Kenya sometimes. So he sits there and he preaches about the love of Christ. He preaches about the grace of, that God gives us. And it's just an amazing time to be there because what happens, I can sit in my hotel room because I work for the army, you know, I get all the nice hotel rooms. I'm not gonna lie, the army takes care of me now. They used to put me in the field, they used to put me in the ditches, they used to make me crawl around through the mud. Now they give me five-star hotels. It would be really easy for me to sit in my comfort zone and stay in the hotel. But no, I make myself available. And I wanna read from Psalms. It's uh, Psalms 143.7. Answer me speedily, O Lord, my spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, lest I be like those who go down into the pit. I like that right there. Lest I be like, like those. Now, I'm not going down to the pit, but I can definitely put my mind in a pit mentality. But I don't want to live there. I want to live in this kingdom mentality, right? Because me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust. For you you're to hear your loving kindness in the morning, every day. Start your day every day listening to that loving kindness that comes from his word. Start your day with him. For in you do I trust. Because me to know the way in which I should walk. For I lift up my soul to you. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. No, I don't have people shooting at me anymore. No, I don't have people hunting me down anymore like I did in the military. But I still have enemies. I have the enemy of sin. I have the enemy of influence. I have the enemy of culture. And these are the things where I bring the word of God in, the grace of God, and I put it inside of my soul so that I have that shield of faith that just blocks those fiery darts that come at me, right? We can sit there literally and say, oh, I don't have an enemy. No. The enemy's in play. The enemy wants to keep us quiet. The enemy wants to keep us silent. The enemy wants me to stop talking to the brother on the street who isn't saved. The enemy wants me to stop sharing my testimony. The enemy wants me to stop, 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 right? Right? Do we agree? Do you agree? Amen. Do you agree with that? He wants us to stop. Because let me tell you something about God. God is omniscient. God knows if the brother on the street that I'm talking to is going to receive Jesus Christ or he's not going to receive Jesus Christ. The enemy doesn't. The enemy doesn't. The enemy wants me to be silent so that I don't plant the seed inside of his soul. So I don't plant the seed inside of his heart. Because he's afraid that he will receive Jesus. So he wants to keep us silent. So I make myself available, right? Because what? Okay, let's submit it. If I could go through this whole room right now, just like my own life. He has raised all of us from something. He has taken us away from the bondage of something. He is continuously raising me up from the things that still hold me back. Because I'm never going to be perfect. But I make myself available to his word. Because his word, his word, his word is what's going to kill. His word is what's going to lift me up. His word is what's going to rise me up. It's like the leopard. The leopard sat there and he said, stand. The leopard stood, right? Yeah. Not the leopard, but he was healed. I'm sorry, that's wrong. The crippled. Sorry about that. But nonetheless, he healed the leopard, right? The, the leopard came and says, oh, I want to be healed. And Jesus, even on the Sabbath, said, be healed. Created all kinds of problems because the enemy didn't want that simplicity. 
Jesus came for a reason to rise us up. Make ourselves available, right? In the morning, pick up the word in the morning, say a prayer in the morning. You know, in Kenya, they do prayer every morning. So every morning at 6 o'clock, there I was. It's not like here. It was like the Olympics. <laughs> you know, you get on the mission field and it's like the Olympics. It's like you're training. And all of a sudden you come back here and you're like, it's kind of funny. You're like, oh my gosh, there's so much. Oh my gosh, let's go. Oh my gosh, I'm just being real with you right now. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And then you come back and you're like, wait, where is it? Where is it? And so as I stand here today, I just say, hey, you know what? Make yourselves available to that beautiful cross. Make yourself available to Jesus Christ. Amen. He's the only one that's going to heal you from whatever you're going through. Amen. We can sit here and say, no, I got it. I got it. I did that for many years. I got it. I got it. But no, you know, I used to do Kenya. Okay, here goes testimony. I used to do Kenya a whole different way. Before I came back to Christ, I did Kenya a whole different way. I did Kenya with the alcohol, I did it with the army guys, I did it boozing it up, I did it with the party scene, I did it in the club. But let me tell you something, I always came back empty, now I come back full, because I'm giving my time to Jesus Christ, I'm giving my time to Him. So today as we go from the service, you know, today is just, just be blessed that you're here. Be blessed that you're sitting here. Be blessed that pastor's sitting here. Be blessed that David's sitting here. Be blessed that Raymond's sitting here. I could just go down the list. These are your brothers and sisters. These are who you're going to stand together with. This is your army. Your local army. Just be available to his work. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this, this opportunity, Lord. And Lord, just bless the rest of the service. We love you. We honor you. We praise you. You are the champion in your name. Thank you. 
Father, bless this communion time for our hearts. Jesus, precious. Amen. Zechariah chapter 3 and verses 3 and 4. Very interesting.
sins of my soul went to that cross and his blood was shed for me let's take it so Father we thank you Lord as we consider as we unity you say do this in remembrance of me Lord we know that you remember us in every detail of our life and everything come between you yes sir we thank you thank you Jesus that we have a garment of praise and a garment of righteousness because of the cross your son and his remembrance of us in Jesus name amen Christ, his body and blood that was shed for us, that delivered us from 
death and bondage of sin. The second feast, the Feast of Weeks, was also known as the Feast of the Harvest. It celebrated the beginning of the harvest when the grain was ripe and ready to be gathered in, which was extremely significant for an agricultural society like theirs. It meant food and uh, means for trade for an entire year and essentially was their life source. So the people were to take the first portion of their crop and sacrifice it to the Lord as a first fruit offering, celebrating God's provision. In the same way, God has given us a life source and giving us His Holy Spirit to indwell us. And with that, a spiritual harvest that we enjoy today. Romans 8.23 states that we have the first fruits of the Spirit which will produce a harvest of new life in us. Um, some of you will be uh, familiar with the famed English preacher Charles Spurgeon. And uh, in his commenting on this passage stated this, At this present moment, we have the first fruits of the Spirit. We have repentance, that gem of the first water, faith, the priceless pearl, hope, the heavenly emerald, and love, the glorious ruby. We are already made new creatures in Christ Jesus by the effectual working of God the Holy Spirit. This is called the first fruit because it comes first. As the wave sheath was the first of the harvest, so the spiritual life and all the graces which adorn that life are the first operations of the Spirit of God in our souls. Lastly, the Feast of Tabernacles, also called the Feast of Ingathering, was a celebration after the harvest of the produce was gathered. And Moses states in verse 15 of the same chapter, Deuteronomy 16, that the purpose of this feast is so that the Lord would bless them in their, in their produce and in all the work of their hands, so that they would be altogether thoroughly, completely joyful. The same is true today of God blessing the work of our hands that we do by faith as we walk according to the Spirit. In all three feasts, the Lord commanded that His people rest, that they rejoice, that they proclaim the Lord's blessings and teach their children them, and to include the foreigners, the widows, and the orphans in their celebration. Also in verses 16 and 17, like we read, He commanded that no man should appear empty-handed, but that every man should give as he is able according to the blessings of God which he has given us. So why is giving such an integral part of the celebration? Certainly God doesn't need anything from our hands. Just like when Noel, my three-year-old daughter, walks up to me with some gift, it's probably a stick or a pine cone she picked up on the side of the road. It's not something that I needed, but I delighted my child in uh, bringing me a gift. God established this principle of sowing and reaping long ago that in giving we position ourselves to receive and God desires us to receive all the blessings He has in store for us. As we prepare for the offering this morning, let us be reminded of God's goodness and what He has already done and how He has already blessed us by providing His Son as a sacrifice for our sins and giving us the gifts of righteousness, His Holy Spirit, and eternal life. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time of the offering. Thank you for reminding us how good you are and how much you love us. Father, search our hearts. Help us to know ourselves, Lord God, and who we are in you. Help us to take greater steps in giving that we may partake in the receiving that you intend for us. We ask it in Jesus' name.
agree with me coming from Romans 5, uh, chapters 1 and 11. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through also, we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, yes. perseverance character, yes. and a character of hope. A hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who has given it to us. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his love. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have now received reconciliation. Onto the, onto the pavement from my house. It was pretty funny. What a great passage. Not funny, not funny at all. I'm just laughing now because of some of the stories afterwards. But hey, my name is Kim Shipley, and I'm glad to be with you today. I've never not been in this pulpit for a period of six weeks before. I can tell you that I think three weeks was the was the maximum because I missed up. Plain, a plain there at some time. But what a beautiful passage when we look at Romans chapter 5. Isn't it beautiful? I mean, we could have read the whole chapter. And it's so beautiful because it really encapsulates what Christ did for us, which is so beautiful. And I'm going I'm to kind of go over the passage a little bit. I'm suspending our, um, our series on the book of Acts just a little bit, as you kind of noticed. Uh, we haven't been uh, speaking much lately. But when he says, therefore, having been justified by faith, uh, having we have peace with God for our Lord Jesus Christ. The term justification by faith is also mentioned in Romans chapter 1. And this was the thing that Martin Luther, if you know who he was, he never founded the Lutheran church, but he was the one that broke away from the Catholic church. And this was what he realized, that he was not justified by works, but that he was justified by faith. And that was huge. That was so huge, it created a, a civil war in Germany. It created a, a war uh, between the Catholic Church and the, what was the upcoming Protestant Church. And um, this idea of justification by faith, it relies on only one thing, not what we do, but what Christ has already done. And that's so different. Because we always think as 
being as religious as we are, even if we're not religious, sometimes we think that we can justify ourselves through our actions. But what he's saying here is being justified by faith means that we are made right with God by what we believe. It's pretty amazing when you think about that. And it's so free. It's so free when you think about it. He says, therefore, having just been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the word peace has a very interesting meaning in the Greek. It says the tranquil state of a, of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. Is that amazing? And so fearing nothing from God content with its earthly lots and whatsoever of whatsoever sort that is. And I think that's so amazing because so often as Christians, not just me, I know it's not just me, it's you too, we live by fear. We live by fear. We're worried what God will do to us if we don't do the right thing or if we don't repent the right way. And I often think of a person who is at the end of their life and maybe they have never come to the knowledge of Christ. And the first thing that they want to do is somehow, you know, if they have a chance, repent to God for all the bad things that they've done, that they can somehow clear the deck without believing in Christ first. But really the first thing, the first and foremost, is our faith. It is our belief. And not what we believe in, but who we believe in. Which is really amazing. So this first verse there is amazing when you think about it, that just being justified by faith, through whom we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And I want to just bring up that one point where he speaks about access into this grace by which we stand. And I think of our standing, like who we are and how we are, and what we are. And that's what we often forget. We begin to think that somehow I'm not accepted by God. Somehow I've got to do a little bit more. But the Apostle Paul here, he speaks of our standing. He speaks of who we are, and the fact of what we are. Not oh, just a question, but a fact. That we are in good standing with God not because of what we've done, but because of whom we have believed in. And then he says in verse 3, and not only that, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And so at the end of this thing, this passage in verse 5, it speaks about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit reveals the love of Christ. And He reveals it in a way that He pours it out to us. And He creates peace in our hearts, a peace so that we should be assured of our salvation. I want to tell you about six weeks ago, I think it was, it was August 1st. I was up in a tree. I was up in a, on our on our beautiful ladder, by the way, that we uh, that we bought for this church. I returned it, uh, but um, actually, Pastor Dan returned it for me. Uh, but I borrowed it to cut a branch, uh, cut some branches at my house, and uh, just so that the story is correct, I don't remember the story actually because I was I was the story, but somehow I fell from that ladder, and uh, that. Obviously, a lot of things. Uh, it's the reason you haven't seen me until today. Um, but the um, the things that happened after that were pretty intense. I was shown to flown to shock trauma uh, for about seven or eight days at the University of Maryland. Maybe some of you saw me there in a little bit of a stupor, or maybe I was uh, speaking, but I don't remember too much of it. And I do remember hearing my daughter's voice, Hannah from uh, California, and my sisters, and my kids, and my wife. It was pretty amazing when I finally came to. I don't know, somehow I knew what had happened, but I don't remember any of it. But I was cutting a branch in a tree, and apparently the branch uh, curled under the ladder. 
and then that's what took me out. So I ended up falling from about 12 to 15 feet onto the pavement, and uh, then a bunch, a whole bunch of other things happened. And uh, after being in shock trauma for seven or eight days, they transferred me actually because I, I had some broken bones. I had a, a lung that needed to be inflated. I had a um, eight broken ribs. I had a broken bone in my back. My skull was broken in two places. And I had blood on the brain. I had a broken cheekbone, and who knows what else, you know? A broke dislocated shoulder. It hurts a little bit still. Um, all that kind of stuff. Um, so they had to physically get me back together. So then they took me to rehab so that I could get better on the rehab end of it. And that took uh, a while. I was in there for quite a while. But they could not keep me in there because I kept getting fevers. And there was this problem, I think they call it, um, was a problem with my, uh, my digestion. And they called it an ileus, where I was blocked from the top and from the bottom. And it created some problems, uh, infections and uh, all kinds of stuff. And I remember Saturday the 15th, in the morning I was feeling pretty good. They had transferred me though from, what was it called again? From rehab to, uh, to a surgical ward at Johns Hopkins. And uh, they had stuck a thing down my nose, and down my throat and all that. So I had eaten for a while. And then uh, I was feeling pretty good though. And the doc said, hey, I think you're gonna go home tomorrow. I was so happy. And, uh, but then by the end of the day, I was, had a very high fever. So they took me down to the, uh, get an MRI. And what happened there was, um, it was quick, I was happy. And uh, I think I was on some medication so I couldn't feel the fever too bad. Well, the doc comes out and he says, hey, you got a little problem here. He says, we need to do emergency surgery. And I'm like, what? You know, what are you talking about? They're talking about cutting my entire stomach open and pulling out all my, you know, you know what, my stomach and my, my bowels. And my, my, my chest and my stomach had extended to about this far. And apparently what had happened was that all, some type of bacteria had gotten in there and air, and it blew a hole somewhere in my intestines. And the doc had found it. He didn't find the hole, but he found um, that when he took a picture with the um, MRI, that, uh, you know, it wasn't quite the same as the x-ray that they had seen prior to that. So he knew exactly what had to happen, was that they had to cut me open and fix it beforehand, which was pretty bad. So me, though, I was kind of like, come on, you know, I'm, you know. I don't know why I was feeling really good. And uh, I was like a little bit, uh, I don't know what you would call it, kind of angry with them. And I said, come on. So he, had, he had a bad way of saying it, too. It was a little bit rushed. Well, they took me toward the emergency room, or the surgery room. And uh, when the actual doc, the head of the team, had come forward, he had said to me, um, kind of explained everything to me. And I still said to him, well, listen, doc, I hear what you're saying. I'm going to get a second opinion, right? This is Saturday night at Johns Hopkins with an entire team of about 10 doctors and anesthesiologists around me and I said come on emergency surgery I'm gonna talk to my doc he's like well who is your doc I told him he said well what does he know about what we're gonna do I said I have no idea, <laughs> you know, I have no idea. but he's my doctor and I'm thinking you guys are trying to make some money here like I was a little drugged up too I mean you know, we were on, and I'm a little paranoid about getting cut up and uh, so sure enough I said I said to the doc well I'm gonna go see him on he said when are you going to see your doctor? Because it's Friday night, Saturday night. And I'll see him on Monday. And uh, he was, you know, if he was a salesman, he would, I would hire him in a heartbeat because he had the best clothes in the world. He said, if I don't do this now, you could be dead by Monday. <laughs> so, and I said, oh, let me talk to my wife real quick. So here's beautiful Casey at my left-hand corner. And so I prayed. I said to the doctors, okay. I talked to Casey, it's okay. I said, we're going to do this. This was uh, on the 15th. And I said, listen, um, so I grabbed her hand, and I grabbed whatever doctor was on my right hand. I think he was a Muslim. And she grabbed the head doc's hand. And I don't know for sure if everybody grabbed hands around, but I prayed. 
And I prayed for my wife. And I prayed for the surgery. And I prayed for the best possible outcome. And then I prayed for the hand, that Jesus would guide the hands of all the surgeons and the anesthesiologists. And it was awesome. And then it just set me free, you know, for a moment. And um, that best possible outcome prayer was amazing. Uh, so on my way down, so that was it. So by Casey, right? She's gone. And uh, they're rolling me down. And then all of a sudden, I'm under all these lights for a little while. And I start to pray a little more. And i got to tell you, the first thought that I had was really odd. Because I had this, this kind of guilt complex. You know what I'm talking about? Like I'm here, and I'm thinking, okay, I could die. Um, maybe I should repent of some things or whatever. It was. I'm looking for things to repent for, you know? And I'm talking to God, and I start doing this repentance prayer. And I'm, then all of a sudden, I hear this voice from God. And he says, you did one thing right a long time ago. You accepted my son as your Savior. You did one thing right. And here I am, putting myself in a guilt complex, you know, until I get cut open and recover. And instead, God is giving me tremendous peace. Like tremendous peace. And this word peace, where it says the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. And so fearing nothing from God. So fearing nothing from God. That's where I was. And I began to rejoice. I began to rejoice in my salvation. Even though I knew I was going to get cut up. And even though I had just offered God a guilt prayer, you know, instead I started offering God prayers of thanksgiving. And it made me think of these verses right here. It made me think of the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it amazing how guilty we get? And yet Martin Luther knew a long time ago, and the saints knew a long time ago, and the apostles a long time ago, that it's not about what we but it's about what Jesus has already done. And here we are thinking, we're thinking like petty change, petty cash. And God is thinking, I got the bank of heaven on your side. You know? I got salvation on your side. I've got glory on your side. And he says, no matter what, we're, what state we are in, what tribulation that we're in, we have hope. We have hope. And the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts the Holy Spirit. So instead of having a guilt prayer, I began to rehearse Bible verses that I memorized in my head. And I, I, I sensed that I was hiding those verses in my heart. You know, that I, that I was actually kind of like, like packing them in, if you know what I'm talking about. Like eating them edibly. Uh, just talking to the Lord about His Word. And then before you know it, they got me talking other things. Because now I, I, would, I asked the doctor for a little bit of root beer. For, for some reason, I was on a root beer kick, and I had no idea why. I hadn't drank for four days at that point, and I had this root beer fantasy. And I said to the doctor, if I could have a little root beer, I'll let you cut me open, no problem, you know? And he says, uh, you're not going to be thinking about root beer in about four minutes. And, that, and uh, he was correct about that. When, when I woke up in my room the next day, there were five, five two-liter... Uh, uh, bottles of mug root beer up on the thing in front of me, and my wife had put a note, I'm rooting for you, which was very, uh, absolutely awesome. Uh, I never did drink any of that root beer. We gave it to the, to the nurse, nor have I had any since. I'm not even a root beer fan, but it was in my head. I had to have some root beer. But, you know, that was so amazing, though, to think of the grace of God yes. and the mercy of God. Yes. And I want you never to forget that in every situation that you are in, in every part of your life that you are in, you should rehearse Romans chapter 5. You should read it over and over and over again because it tells the truth. Listen to what it says in verse 6. For when we were without strength, I don't know a person who could be, you know, having found myself in the hospital after, you know, kind of coming to I was fearful. I was in this very strange place. 
I felt like I was in a basement. It turns out I was on the fourth floor at Shock Trauma. But the way they had me facing against the wall. But it, it brought fear to me. It brought all kinds of things to me. And then I, I thought about poor people that spend all that time in the hospital, way beyond 24 days. And then I go to this other location, and the same thing happened. And actually, I never felt really good until they cut me open and fixed me on the inside. Then I started to feel better, even though I couldn't eat. I just felt good, you know? But you look at this verse, when you're without strength, when you're in that situation where you have no strength to pray, to pray. When you have no strength to help yourself. When you have no strength to be good. And that's a lot of our problem. Is we try to be good. We try to be religious. We try to be better than we were before. But we don't even have the strength to manifest that for more than a couple days or a week. But listen to what he says. For when we're without strength in due time, Christ died for the godly. Is that what it says? No, he died for the ungodly. Ungodly is a strong word. It means a person that is without strength. It means a person that was, is without hope. It means a person who is steeped in sin. For scarcely, he says, for a righteous man will one die. Like, I might die for someone who is good. I might die for my wife. I might die because I think that they're worth me dying. But he says this, yet perhaps for a good man may someone dare to die. But listen to this. God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were perfect, Christ died for us. No. While we were still sinners. While we were still sinners. While we were impure. While we were unwashed. Isn't it amazing? That's the state that we found ourselves in when we learned to know Jesus. Not that I had done such a good job that I had earned this great achievement and I'm at the top of the ladder. No, no more ladders for me. I'm at the top of the something. I'm at the peak of my spirituality. I am so good right now that God now can accept me. It's not what he says. He says God demonstrates his love for us in a way that only he can demonstrate. Yes. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know what that means? Though God saw the future, you still have to think that Jesus was stuck in time on purpose. And he had no guarantees that anybody would accept him. No guarantees whatsoever that anybody would believe in him. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. It's very personal. It's very much something that I can live with every day. Because every day I have a challenge. Every day I have to deal with me. I have to deal with my sin. I have to deal with my problems. I've got to deal with my relationships. I've got to love people. You know, I have to be this person, you know, that I want to be, but I can only be who God has made me to be. I can only be who, what I've accepted in Christ. This is much more I'm saved from wrath from Him. For if we were enemies, now what is an enemy? An enemy is a hated person. Someone who is odious. Someone who is hateful. And someone who is hostile towards God. That's who we were. We were enemies. For when we were enemies, he says, we were reconciled. You know what reconciled means? It means to return to favor. Isn't that something? We were out of favor. We were enemies. We were hateful. We were hostile. But now we've been returned to favor. Meaning what? Meaning, just I loved what David said about his daughter. I mean, God looks at us like his kids, like his babies, because we believed in him, because we've accepted his love. He says this, when we were reconciled to God through the death, which is something David mentioned, 
through the death of his son. Having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God for our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have received the reconciliation. And so the message today is for one thing. It is for you to understand that you can live a guilt-free life. I'm not saying that the guilt is not going to going to come in on you, because it did on me. Okay? I've been a believer for a long time, but I was also in a situation that I had never been in before. I haven't been in the hospital since I dislocated my shoulder at 17 years old, 41 years ago, which is pretty crazy, right? But that's the last time I realized I had been in the hospital. And I don't like the hospital very much. But what I do like, I do like what it taught me. It taught me that Christ is everywhere. It taught me that I am favored by God. That I have been returned to favor. It taught me that I can live without guilt, knowing that Christ died for me when I was still hostile to Him. When I was still His enemy. And that He poured the love of the Holy Spirit abroad in my heart. And he's, He wants to do that for you today. He wants to love you. He wants you to know His Son if you don't know His Son. And it's not a big religious thing. It's just saying yes to Jesus. Jesus, I know you've died for my sins. I know that you shed your blood for me. I know that you rose again on the third day and that you're seated in heavenly places for me right now. And that's what we believe. We believe in the resurrection of Christ. We believe that He died for us because He loves us. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in Him would never perish but have eternal life. You know why? For God sent His Son into the world not to condemn the world. Not to condemn them. Isn't that good? You are not condemned today. You are not condemned. He didn't come into the world to condemn the world. So much of religion is condemnation. So much of what we believe about ourselves is self-condemnation. But if we can get our mind straight, understanding that Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him, in verse 17, might be saved. Isn't that amazing? Let's pray. Bow your heads. If you're here today and you've never received Christ as your Savior, and you want to believe in Him as your Savior, just say, Lord Jesus, I believe in You. I believe You died for my sins. Say this in your heart. I believe You died for my sins. I believe that You rose again. And I believe that You live right now to save me. Say that in your hearts. If you believe that today, then you will receive the gift of eternal life. And even more, you'll receive a gift of salvation that will change you from the inside out. It's never about new clothes. It's never about a new hair. It's not about shaving or taking a shower. It's about the love of God for you. <clears throat> Say that in your hearts. If you're believing in Christ right now, just raise your hand. If you've never believed in Him as your Savior. Thank you so much today. Thank you so much for your, for your love and for your prayer for me, and uh, God bless you.
Lucy Helenga. Okay, Lucy, if you don't know, has suffered the loss of her eyesight and has suffered now the loss of the second eye or partially. And she's in South Africa. Pastor Brent flew um, back from Costa Rica to here, spent the day, half a day. He actually visited me uh, before he went to the airport, but he's in South Africa with her now. Feel free to text or uh, WhatsApp him or anything like that. But let's pray for Lucy's healing uh, and our benediction. She's under a treatment now of um, steroids, but I'd love to see her come back and go to Wolverine Institute. So let's pray for her right now, okay? Heavenly Father, we pray for Lucy, Lord Jesus. We pray for her absolute healing. And we even pray not only for this eye, but the other eye apparently too still should be able to see because it's all got to do with the optic nerve. So we pray for her that you would heal her 100%. And we pray for Pastor Brent right now that you give him the wisdom that he needs and that she needs. And if it's if it's in your will to bring them back here, that would be the best uh, that I could imagine. Lord, bring her back, I pray. And we ask it now. And I pray for this congregation, Lord, that you would... Um, Give them an awesome week, especially for those kids that are starting school again tomorrow, Lord. Lord Jesus, bless them. And school, college, high school, elementary school, and for all the moms and dads that are going back to work after a wonderful holiday tomorrow. Give us a great day of rest, I pray. Yes. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would bless each and every one who came today, and those who couldn't come. And I ask you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be dismissed.